Chief Netrale Gauhati. Uh, Dr. Sagar Bhargav will be speaking instead of uh, Dr. Sony Goyal today. And uh, myself, I'll be speaking on Yak Capsulotomy. A very warm welcome to all the postgraduates also. Uh, today is the last day of CATRAC. And then from uh, tomorrow, we, uh, from Monday, we will be doing uh, UVA, which is uh, very interesting. And all the top national faculties have uh, given their consent to uh, join this program. I would like to introduce the moderator for this session. Uh, we have a very young, dynamic lady with us, Dr. Niluparna Deori. Uh, she is currently the consultant in the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology at Sri Shrankadev Netrale in Assam. Uh, Dr. Deori has done her fellowship in comprehensive ophthalmology and orbit and oculoplasty uh, from the same institution and also completed her training in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus from the same institute. Her main area of interest are genetics and research. She has been actively involved in wet lab and cataract teaching for residents at Shankar Dev Netrale, which is a beautiful, amazing institution uh, in Gauhati. Apart from publication, presentation, instruction courses at state, national, and international conferences, she has also received the APO Achievement Award of 2019, and uh, she has already received the International Hero Award of AIUS 2020. She is also an AIOS LDP graduate of 2018 and 19 batch. Currently, she is the executive member of the Young, Young Ophthalmologist Society of India, and she is the president of the state chapter of UOC and editor of the pediatric issue of Your Time. She is very helpful, and uh, we will share her uh, uh, contact details. Any postgraduate, any resident who needs any guidance, who needs uh, uh, any uh, information, about uh, fellowships, etc., she will be very happy to help. Uh, I'd like to request Dr. Niluparna Deori to please introduce the faculty who are here. Dr. Niluparna. Yeah, thank, yes, thank you so much for the very uh, nice uh, introduction that you have given me. I welcome you all once again to this uh, excellent uh, program that has been conducted by the API Institute. And today, as Sir has already mentioned, we will be speaking, uh, we are the last session for the uh, cataract. So we'll be speaking on a few uh, tips and tricks and the principles of uh, handling uh, cataract in different situations. So I'd like to share a, a PPT where I will be introducing the, um, is my uh, presentation visible to all? Not yet. Uh, is it now? I have already shared. Uh, okay. Uh, anyhow, we'll carry on with that. So we have cataract surgery in trauma, subluxated lens, and weak zonules, which will be covered by Dr. Ajay Paul. And uh, then we have post yak uh, uh, I mean yak laser post cataract surgery by Dr. S uh, Satyajit Sinha sir. And then the management of residual refractive surprise post cataract surgery by Dr. Sagar Bhargava. So uh, before we uh, begin the presentation, I have uh, the honor to introduce to you Dr. Ajay Paul. He is the director of BBI Foundation Group of Hospitals, Kolkata. He has completed his MS ophthalmology from Guwahati Eye University and veterinary training from Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai, and has been in practice for the last 28 years. He has specialized in femtofeco and medical retina. He has performed a lot of live surgeries and presented in both national and international conferences. And to name a few, they are ESCRS, ASCRS, and the American Academy. He has been a challenging case winner in three consecutive ESCRS conference and the winner of the DOS uh, conference of the OSWB, that is the West Bengal State uh, Video uh, Best Video Award, and a gold medalist of the IISRI 2009 and 16. He has been a FECO trainer for the last 25 years. I welcome you, Dr. Uh, Ajay Paul. Sir, uh, I would now request you to kindly uh, share your presentation so we can move ahead with the uh, presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nirod Panna. Thank you, Satyajit, and all the team of ABI Institute. This is a wonderful program, and I've been following it. And my son, rather, is doing post graduation MGM Pondicherry. He and his whole group are following it, and they are really happy with it. So, thanks for that, you know, introduction. Well, I so I'll be talking on what you call the scattered surgery in trauma, subluxated lens, and weak zone use. Now, this is a very vast topic, I know, 
But then trauma is something which all the juniors, all the postgraduates, they are ones who are the first line of warrior in case of trauma. Most of the time, they are the ones who will be attending those cases. So this is probably the app. This is the first surgical experience. Most of those uh, postgraduates get it. So if you look at trauma of the globe, now this is the international classification, international way of taking terminology, Birmingham Eye Trauma Terminology System, which says that once the injury is there, a globe, closed globe and open globe, that's how they define it. It can be a contusion. We'll be talking, showing you uh, some but videos slide. on contusion. Hello? Light is not moving. You'll have to... No, click. no, no. I'm just, I'm just uh, highlighting those. Open globe. Uh, you can see penetrating and perforating. Is it moving now? Yes? We Has have the same slide on the first one. No, no, now. Uh, is it not moving? No. Uh, you'll have to... Click on the slides after slide. No, no, it's, it's uh, there in the slide. No, we have to uh, make it a full screen and then no, no, it's, go uh, ahead from, with the... uh, from my side, it is full screen. Can you uh, okay. see, see, this is, uh, has it gone full screen now? No, not there. It is, yeah, yeah, it is showing. Have, it's more, it's not full screen. Now but, we have uh, slide. But I'm, I am, for me, it is showing full screen. Uh, can anybody? Uh, yeah, can you uh, see yeah. that? Yes, yes, yes. You, you need to click that, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, 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 Birmingham uh, I trauma. That slide is there. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. Sir, second slide is there, but in a presentable mode, sir. You just click on this uh, button, sir. Which button? This but third got... one. No, no. It's... The icon is there next to your volume icon, sir. No, it, I am I'm, I'm getting only the I am only I am getting only the the whole uh, presentation. This one, sir. This one. I'm stopping sharing and again sharing it. Uh, that may be a good idea. One second, let me close so it while again. Sir is getting ready for his presentation, I would like to say that uh, we will be taking a few questions in between the, uh, uh, I mean, the talk. And any questions, any queries, uh, we will uh, welcome them. And you can post them on the message or the chat box. And we'll take them up uh, in the subsequent uh, discussion part or maybe in between the uh, session. Uh, uh, do you see the presentation now? We see the can presentation. You see the present huh? Yes, it's can you visible. See the, it's visible. You can make it in a yeah, slideshow mode. It's in a slideshow. Uh, see, see, I am. I have made it in in my year. It has come slideshow. Has it come? Uh, no, sir. I think probably the bandwidth is low. So what we can do alternately? Uh, you can. I can, close I can that present it like this only. No, no. Now, sense. now you are getting. Yeah. Now, I think that it is uh, staying in the slide sorter mode only. So let me uh, yes. present it from here. It's, uh, now you can see this slide, Birmingham Eye Test, Eye Trauma Terminology System. Yeah, visible, sir. Okay. So uh, yeah, I just saw about the definition, the uh, uh, trauma of the globe is uh, the closed globe and the open globe. You can have a contusion, a penetrating trauma and the perforating trauma. Now, if you can you see the next slide now? You will have to click on the slide in the slide sorter, then it will change. No, no I've just, just clicked on the slide sorter. It is there. For me, no. I can see you. That's come now. Open globe, I think there's a lag time between the yes. Open globe can be penetrating or perforating. So let us uh, come to uh, when the residents come to so it can be a simple pellet or it can be some sharp. Uh, sharp uh, when the hammer and chisel, the sharp metallic part that can go in and you can have to have the seniors coming in in this form of uh, you can uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, foreign body in the globe you need the CT scan or x-ray. But uh, if you have to see these cases, basically you have to go and look at this, this is the corneal trauma and a, a cataract that you can see. With the history, you have to see the nature of injury. Is it IOB? Is it clean? 
metal versus plant uh, matter because most of the metallic injuries you can have that they can be non-infective because they are heated up sharp arsenal metallic things only thing is the long term you can have siderosis etc but when you use a plant matter or wood it can be because of uh, uh, you can have fungal infection or uh, bacterial infection. Timing of the injury is very important. On examination, you need to see the visual acuity, extent of injury, cornea lens, X-ray, CT scan if there is a suspect of intraocular foreign body or other injuries like globe, leads, orbit and face and status of the other, other eye and IL calculation of other eye before you take those cases. Uh, can you see this? Next slide, is it there, visible? Satyajit, patient counseling. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Visible. Sir. Patient counseling. counseling. Yeah. Vision will never be as good as the other eye. That has to be told. Will require time for recovery. Will require more surgery in future. You need to have uh, counsel the patient that there might be sympathetic ophthalmia or higher future chance of retinal detachment. And then consent also, you have to ask them that you might have to do lensectomy, possible uh, implant, IOL, CTR, or sutures, and possible vitrectomy. So these are some things which have to be told to them. Now let's come to this small video. I think I'll have to shop share this. Uh, can you see the video now? Yes. Yeah, so this is the yes. uh, patient which has come with a corneal tear and you can see the, the lens is also ruptured. You as a resident or a senior, maybe postgraduate, you can attend these cases. Now cornea, it came around seven to 10 days after injury. So it looked like the, the cornea wound is sealed, but it's a small wound which is there where I try to put in viscoelastic and then go in inside and take a uh, bimanual and then see that the corneal wound is open. And now I have to decide to now it's important how you suture this wound. It has to be one millimeter in either side of the, uh, the lip, lips. Take it there, take it there, and then one millimeter away from it, 80% of thickness. Now 80% of depth, you'll have to go. Take one, two, three, four rounds. Go the opposite way again for the next and then cut the sutures. In this case, this was a small you know, cut. You might need to have three or uh, four sutures that and most of the time as uh, as a resident you will be asked to just close the corneal suture and most of the time you will not be attending that case and that very next uh, same day probably next day in the, uh, your uh, normal routine OT. Now this is where your uh, seniors might be doing this is where by manual you can go in go in there and remove those uh, cortical matter because there is opening there. You need to do a vitrectomy. As you can see, the vitrector goes in, cuts those vitres because this has been a penetrating, a sharp penetrating wound, which has pierced both the anterior and the posterior capsule. The vitrector can also be used as a cutter plus IA mode. Now you can alternate between IA and cutter and you can just remove it. And then put a, the Choice of the lens is a multi-piece lens. Now you can maneuver it, put it over the sulcus, rotate it. Now you can see this is a horizontal cut, so rotate it, bring it the other side, and the other lens, yes, there. You can place it horizontally, and many a times there might be remnant vitreous. You might have to read, uh, do a vitrectomy, and the corneal cut, as you can see, this is gone. You can just close the wound at that time. And definitely, if it is a young or a, uh, this was a young 10 year old boy, we had to do it. So we close the main incision also. This is very important that you close the main incision also in these cases. So uh, let me sh share again the, I think I'll have to share the, uh, is the video gone now? Is it still showing? Video is gone now. Okay. Uh, have you got the presentation again? No. Not yet. No. no, no, no one second. Uh, yeah. So I just have the video. I think I'll have to go to the next slide. So the questions. Nirod uh, Parna, you can ask them. Can you see the slide? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Preferred suture in corneal tear. I think this is a question yeah, for. Yes, I can see your slide, sir. 
Hmm. So the question here for uh, all the postgraduates to know is that what kind of suture uh, would you prefer, uh, suture material, to uh, suture the tear or a perforation or, and if you don't have a GA available, what type of anesthesia would you prefer in an open globe corneal tear? So these are some of the questions that comes to our mind that uh, uh, should we uh, suture the corneal tear first and then for uh, surgery later on, for example, the cataract surgery later on. And uh, when you are in a fix, like uh, should it be 10 0, 9 0, or 8 0 nylon or vitriol? But the answer always remains that it should be 10 0 nylon if it is a, uh, what is that called? It's a corneal uh, perforation. But you also need to keep your 6 0 and 8 0 vital ready. For example, if you have a uh, penetration that uh, Crosses your limbus and uh, is in the scleral area, so that that also needs to be sutured. And if your a type of anesthesia GA is not available, especially in this corona times, so we need to go ahead with substitutes. Uh, therefore, uh, I would uh, like to Dr. Ajay sir uh, to continue with the yeah continue with the answers for these questions and uh, and the panelists yeah. if they have so, uh, yeah, add something. Peribulbar subtenon infiltrate or no anesthesia? I think, uh, can anybody answer? I mean, any of the PG, do they have any option there? Because that, this is an open, uh, open, um, the open globe corneal tear. So, would it be possible to give retrobulbar, peribulbar? Because you have to give a, a bulbar pressure. But something that can be done is the subtenon infiltrate, where you go in the lower fornix, basically, just uh, remove the, uh, with a scissor, with your corneal scissor, just take off the conjunctiva, take off the tendons, and then take a bent needle and just infiltrate inside. So this is something a uh, 1.5 or 2 uh, ml is enough to form that anesthesia. Anybody has any other uh, opinion on that? One PG has written no anesthesia. These questions no anesthesia. are postgraduates. These questions. Yeah, this for postgraduates. No oh, anesthesia. Okay, oh, I answered it for the first. <laughs> so that's what I asked. Oh, with postgraduates. Okay. Okay. So we okay, have that, one. We can go ahead. Another one. Yeah, okay. So I think we move ahead. We move ahead. So placing an eye well is again uh, uh, classic teaching is leave it effective due to infection risk. Benefit of placing an IOL is support for the remaining capsule can plug a hole in the posterior fold and have posterior capsule and have a barrier effect. IOL is not for refractive purpose because the central corneal scar will still limit the vision for counting at the best counting figure. So three piece IOL is again preferred uh, since more placement option and stability is there. So this is something as to be because or a PMMA single piece, not a foldable hydrophilic in these sort of cases where the capsule is open, where you cannot find deep back. So when you are placing on the sulcus, definitely either uh, PMMA lens or a three-piece multi-piece lens, a three-piece foldable hydrophobic multi-piece. So post-op, you know, uh, patients should be told about reading, not do, state where don't take it to snell and charge, hand movement is okay, slit lamp, look for AC depth, next day look for corneal laceration. Careful serial test, the fluorescein, if no leak, then check for IOP. Post-op regime is uh, steroid antibiotics. NSAIDs are best avoided. Cycloplegics, definitely. Look at posterior segment via indirect ophthalmoscope. Close follow-up care for first few months. Need a continue follow-up for life, future. Give cornea at least 6 to 12 months to heal before removing the suture. Wait for topographic stability with months of follow-up and possible topo-guided eczema, ablation, and corneal transplant. But these are something you can, depending on the center, depending on where you're watching, or uh, you can always ask the patients. So again, the question, post-op NSAID. Yes, Niluk Uh Can you sir, move the slide, please? I, uh, yeah. No, no. So the yeah. question postgraduate says, uh, would you prefer post-operative NSAID? And when will you remove the corneal sutures? So, do we have someone can uh, just join in and uh, answer the queries? Okay, we'll move on to the uh, next 
in the meantime, if they answer, if they in the after we stop for the uh, next uh, slide movement, then we can see. Further. Okay, so we are coming to close go condition now. Can you see the slide? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes, you can see yeah, okay. so if you look at the mechanics of the blunt trauma in the eyeball, the moment there is a blunt trauma in frontal mama where there has been no rupture, the, the whole direct impact goes and there is a compression wave force which is reflective again back. Now, this can cause a lot of injury, it can cause a corneal tear, it can cause an angle recession over there, the lens can you know, rupture, the, it can subluxate, it can dislocate or you can have a retinal tear right either superior or uh, nasal aspect. So these are the uh, things that can occur. And these are some of the stellate. You can see the opacity is here. There is still opacity. The iris has torn. There is a cortical matter coming out. So if you look at the traumatic damage of the lens, what happens? There is a rupture of lens capsule, influx of aqueous humor, and hydration of the lens fiber, which takes place. And if that is ruptured. And in case of blunt trauma, where there is no rupture, there can be epithelial dysfunction, edematous response to the superior cortical lens, and vacuole pocket can then become trapped permanently within the lamellar zone with new layers are elaborated over that lesion, and there is a diffuse fibrous metaplasia. Now, this is what all the changes, this is the uh, histopathological uh, uh, the section that you can see. There are a lot of uh, uh, the metaplastic changes that uh, in spite of not paying. So most of the time, what you end up is you can get this sort of changes, as you can see here. Uh, the posterior star severed opacities or anterior subcapsular opacity, posterior subcapsular or capsular fibrosis, capsular, you know, capsule can, can become thickened and that's how it forms. So these are some of the pictures, the posterior stellate, uh, there's the iris trauma, as you can see, there's the iris tear here, uh, iris bombay shape, and there are a lot of uveitis, there might have been a hyphema, now there is a posterior sinica and capsular fibrosis. So these are the ways that cataract men present. Now this was one of those patients who had presented to us with a white cataract because she was fluffy, and going by the record, three months back, patient had shown elsewhere, there was a posterior capsular tear in these cases. So now the question, yes, uh, can you see the questions now? Hello? I can see the questions. So the question is, uh, in case of plant trauma, an early lentil opacity uh, is there. So when would you prefer gonioscopy, indirect or the role of gonioscopy? and then indirect ophthalmoscopy with scleral depression, or your preference for investigation would be an ASOCT or an UBM. So uh, I'd like to come back to Dr. Ajay Pal, sir, for the previous question. We have two persons, the Dr. Afifa Azam and Dr. Kapil Sharma, who has uh, answered that they would like to remove the sutures after three weeks and preferably go ahead with systemic NSAIDs. So, uh, do you have, uh, uh, systemic NSAID is okay, that is for pain, but the topical NSAIDs are better avoided because of the corneal. Uh, if you are doing a central corneal uh, uh, rupture and they don't know that it might delay the healing. So, maybe in the early stages, you avoid topical uh, NSAIDs. And the second question is uh, whether cutting the suture after three weeks, definitely not. Uh, the corneal sutures that are there, you have to wait minimum three months. Ideally, it should be six months when you remove, because that is when the corneal heal, and that is when the changes should be. But definitely not in three weeks. That's what I suppose it is. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, sir, for the answer. And I hope uh, our uh, guests have uh, 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 learned from uh, Dr. Paul, sir. That is six weeks because you need the healing to get it done and no top uh, system in the sides for as of now. Topical answer. So thank you so much. Uh, topical insights for the purpose. So uh, I think we'll get the uh, answers to the previous questions, uh, uh, sir. So we can move on to your video, I guess, because. Uh, uh, sir, the I next video, you. I think uh, I'll uh, stop uh, sharing. Uh, yeah, one second. Uh, let me uh, open that video again because this all videos cannot be opened at the same time. That's what I realized. Uh, I'm opening the second video there. I opened it. I've stopped it. Now again, I go back to my Microsoft. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, share. Okay. Now this is again uh, another trauma as I've shown the picture. The patient came to us after six months after trauma. You can see there's a uh, PCR which is already there. This was a softer cataract PCR and the patient was not able to see. Now this is the patient where you uh, I'm doing a capsulorexis. Uh, can you see the capsulorexis being done? And this is uh, how it is. OK, this is a soft cataract. And I would approach it just like I would do in a PPC. I'm doing just a visco dissection, visco dissection, not hydro dissection, and then hydro delineation. After doing hydro delineation, what I have done is I have removed the. I need to take that out. I have not done a hydro dissection. I have removed the sleeve from my phaco tip. I've just cut it here, and I'm using at it as a wide bore you know, uh, the, the aspirator. And here I'm pushing in um, the viscoelastic. Now this is called dry aspiration, dry. You are not using any fluid. Go to this side. I'm using the side port just to take it out because I need to, because I know there is a, a tear there and pre-existing tear because of the trauma. I changed my hand and gradually go forward. And then Taking the IA, once I have separated, I put in a high molecular viscoelastic to just tack the cover the hole. That's what visco to using sodium hyaluronate plus chondroitin sulfate. The well known trade name is the viscoat. You have got oroquot also. And then do the bimanual IA, but again, I'm using only viscoelastic from the other side and taking out. Be careful just to, you can see bimanual IA, taking all the uh, lens material from the periphery. There it goes, as I've removed almost all, and still I have maintained that I have not increased the uh, PC tear. And then I go in again, put in this. All these cases, I prefer to put a multi-piece hydrophobic lens, as I have said, in all these prisms because you have more option. You can put it in the bag, you can put it in the sulcus in case it is escaping and going. You can manipulate it, rotate it. The single piece is not available. Single piece is to be avoided given in the sulcus because of the bigger haptic goes and rubs against those iris, and you can have problem. So I think. I can again share the um, presentation again. Can you see the presentation now? Yes. OK, so I come to the yes. second part. Uh, we have just finished that. So I have just uh, spoken about the blunt trauma. Anybody has any answer to that blunt trauma? The uh, why, no, when no. will you do? Conioscopy, indirect ophthalmoscopy, or no? Yes. No, no, not yet. No, not they yet. Answer. The okay. I okay. Then let us move to the second part. Subluxated lens or ectopia lentis is defined as a displacement or malposition of the crystalline lens of the eye. It was better to first describe it in 1749, and the Stellwerk subsequently coined the term ectopia lentis in 1856. It can be etiologically congenital, metabolic disorder, traumatic, or consecutive or spontaneous. Now, if you look at this, look at the capsular zonulever. What happens in subluxate? They are either weak or deficient or absent. The bundles, if you look at the, uh, the zonules, there are bundles which an, uh, attach both at the uh, fornix, the anterior capsule, and the posterior capsule. They extend 1.5 millimeter to the anterior and 1 millimeter to the posterior. Now, if you look at these zonules, they are they measure around 5 to 30 micron in diameter. It is composed of microfibrils. Biochemically, they are composed of fibrillin, a protein product of the gene and of the gene linked to Marfan syndrome. Now, this is the fibrillin protein, now, which is what happens in the various conditions that I would come to it. Now, if you look at the pathogenesis, if you remember your uh, uh, embryology, the early lens packet, this is the mesodermal persistent remnant of the tunica, vas tunica vasculosa lentis, the mechanical interference in this development with the development of zonules and neuroectodermal. There is a mal development of the pigmentary epithelium. So you can see the lens fascicle. This is the speckled and as the tunica vascular second. So there is some deficient in the development of zonules that take place. And for this, you have 
Besides the congenital, you have those systemic association like homocystinuria. This is most common. You have the sulfate oxidase, the hyperlysinemia, LR Darlow's, Crossens, Repsoms, Nais, all these syndromes, and the mandibulofascicular uh, facial listosis and Sturge Weber. Now, besides, now we'll come to the most common ones. That it can be isolated familial ectopia lentis, which are autosomal recessive. It can be a single, it cannot be, may be associated with nothing, just ectopia. People may be normal, and people may be displaced. This is ectopia lentis at pupillae, where the pupil is displaced to the side and the lens goes down. It may or may not be associated with any systemic condition. Now, these are autosomal recessive, and the most common that talked about is the Marfan syndrome, which is prevalent in 5% of 5 per 1 lakh, rather. It's autosomal dominant and it's characterized by skeletal, cardiovascular, and other ocular abnormalities. Now, this is due to the mutation of that gene that we said, the fibrillin gene at chromosome 15 and 21. This is the one that takes place in Marfan syndrome. Let us come to those ocular features. Lens is generally upward subluxation. 75% of cases is upward subluxation. Zonules are usually intact in Marfan's. You can have lattice, you can have lattice generation with retinal detachment, axial myopia, angle anomalies and glaucoma, cornea plana or megalocornea or blue sclera. Now these are some things you can have. And the systemic are those, you know, the, uh, the lumbar trunk disproportion, arachnodactyly when the fingers are long, you can have pectus excavators, you can have high arch palate, and main the cardiological abnormalities, aortic dilatation, dissection and regurgitation and mitral valve prolapse. And you can have patient might die of in the later days of uh, dissecting aneurysm or aortic aneurysm. But second condition is the homocystinuria because of the defect in cystathio beta synthesis. This, uh, this is again autosomal recessive. Now this is because of the uh, inborn error of metabolism of this sulfur containing amino acid homocystinuria. You can have uh, uh, the homocysteine, the degradation do not take place. So you can have urine, the homocysteine in the urine. So this is one of the tests that is uh, uh, what you can advise. Now the lens here is downward subluxation with the disintegration of zone. There is no zonules in the pupils. And besides this, there are mental handicap increase, platelet thickness. Now this is what happens in homocystinuria. And well marches in the syndrome. This is what you have with brachydactyly. I mean, this is what the fingers are small. Unlike both the homocystinuria and marfans, their fingers are first and the lens here. As a whole, this is a microspherophagia. The lens comes in the anterior chamber. Many a time, patient may come with a acute angle closure glaucoma, or the whole uh, angle may be blocked, or the whole AC. So you may have to do an ICC and move these lenses. So we have questions here again. So uh, the questions at this point of the talk is: in case of uh, subluxated lens position, where is the lens position? That is up and out in which condition, down and in in which condition, and when does it come out in the AC? So uh, Dr. Paul has uh, very sincerely explained all the features and how they are placed. So, <clears throat> so we already have an answer for uh, up and out, that is with Marfan's, that's correct. And for down and in, can we have an answer? And then, uh, Anteriorly in will matches. Okay, that's great. So we already have answers to your questions. Good, sir. Good. I think so, we can so, so I think the, this yeah. is more yeah. The, yeah, very uh, <laughs> genuinely. <laughs> so this Thank is you. the matches near spherophakia. You can have this. Uh, you can have uh, this condition in intraoperative cases. I think you had a class on pseudo exfoliation. You can have this condition. You can have trauma. Though there's a lack of time, and you can have spontaneous subluxation in all these conditions. Mechanical stretching of the eyeball, book thermos, high myopia, staphyloma, intraocular tumor, and and inflammatory like destruction of zonules, hypermature cataract, cyclotic adhesion, and vitreous bands. These are also the conditions that you can have. So the surgical principle is basically the bag is not here or bag has shifted from here along with the lens so all you have to do is keep the bag in this position and uh, uh,
take there with the lens and put in an artificial lens and keep the bag, fix it in the bag, anchor the bag to the sclera and how you do it, and how you, during the surgery, I'll just come to the surgical part. And while doing this, you need to have this capsular tension rings. Basically, there are three sizes. Most of the time you get 10 and 12, 11 is not very easily available, but some companies make. So these 10 millimeters are those for actual length or hypermetropic, less than 24 millimeter. And uh, uh, 12 millimeter are for myopic, high myopic, more than 28 millimeter. And for the normal, you can get 11, you can use 10 or 11, but then high myops, definitely you should use 12. So these are the CTRs. Now this CTR was first, you know, uh, described in 1990 or 91, I suppose, by Dr. Hara from Japan. And you have Sioni, the Robert Sioni, uh, the American surgeon who has different single Sioni, uh, left, right, and you have got double Sioni. This is somewhere in uh, late 90s. Robert Sioni described it. And this is also called Ahmed, you know, IK Ahmed. These are the uh, devices where you have the you can attach it to the sclera tie to the sclera this is uh, called a capsular tension deep segment cts now these are all things that are required and by besides this the iris retractors and the capsular hooks we'll come to that uh, small surgical video where we'll see the iris hooks and capsular hooks and okay i have the question again very easy i just spoke about it capsular tension ring sizes Yes, Nilod Parna. So I need to move the, yes, yeah, I got his slide. So mm. uh, what are the capsular tension rings and what are the sizes that are available as uh, of, for the CTR? So this is the question for now and uh, we will uh, expect some answers, I think, in a few moments. Okay. So uh, we already got the answers. At 10, 11, and 12. <laughs> so okay, nice. okay, okay. So, so uh, they have been, so there are different sides. So let yeah, us yeah. come to the surgical principle. If it is 90 degree subluxation, most of the time we just use a CTR or even the multi-piece lens. If it's less than 90 or say, uh, say uh, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, you can just put a multi-piece lens. The haptic of the multi-piece lens can stay there and that does the work. And if it is 180 degree subluxation, you need to do both CTR and Sioni ring. Now, these are the capsular hooks, as you can see, and this is the CTR that has been put in. Then you have the CT segments that are going in to cover that area. And then you can see at the end of the surgery, the CT segment is here. And if it is more than 270 degree, you have need both capsular hooks, iris hooks, and then you need to have Sioni ring, the ring with the ear. And this is the case of spherophakia, where you have got two CT segment or two Sioni ring to keep the bag in the center. And if everything fails, you have the option of putting intrascleral or glue diol or SFI. So I think with this, we'll share the last or second last video. Uh, can I go back? I will stop share this. Just open that video now. Yeah, can you see the video? Yes. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah. So this is a uh, subluxated cataract. You can see the lens is totally in forward. So we are putting a high molecular viscoelastic there. And we are starting the capsular axis away from the subluxated area. It is going round and round. As you can see, this is the toughest job in doing a capsular axis in these conditions. And then I'm doing so just three openings and one, two, three, and then I'm putting those. These are the capsular hooks. You can see it has got a bulb there. Now this goes and presses against this fornix. One, two. So I've got, I'm, I'm making an artificial 
zone you see the anterior attachment zones which are there and the posterior and the ctr goes in goes to the fornix and it is giving the equatorial pressure so you have got a vertical and so i have made up for the absence of these zones i have made up a, a artificial uh, everything and so the cataract surgery is done once that is done i am putting a multi piece lens there as you can see and again i have preferable multi piece lens because i have option if anything goes wrong i can always and then how i put the ct segment this is how the ct segment goes in to straight needle with a uh, nino nylon i'm putting it and this is maneuvered goes right into the uh, back and this is the railroad technique where one needle goes in the straight needle goes in the other needle also goes in as you can see and and just a, a little bit of scleral groove there i just put a suture and that's how the whole thing is over i'll just share one more small video the last video as you can see this is uh, one second Yeah, there I come. So just the recent advance that you have in subluxated cataract, you can use the femto laser. As you can see, this is the, uh, the rexis. The, the beauty of this is that you can place the rexis. You can uh, move the cursor and bring the rexis to the uh, area where you can see, and that's the result. You have got a rexis ready-made. Now this is the toughest part of doing the subluxated cataract, and you can just see how once you've done the rexis with the femto laser, you can just peel it off. So there's no way of getting uh, uh, into that process of how you can lose the rexis and the CTR goes in and the same way CT, uh, the uh, capsular hook goes in. And there's the same way, a little bit of innovation that will come to you. We have put in a lens. Once the lens is there, we are putting the CT segment again, and we are using, in this case, a, a iris, the hook. Now, this iris hook, instead of the suture, there are chances the suture might give off. The iris hook goes there, and this just goes in, in a interscleral uh, tuck there. And that's how you have the lens well centered and just suture that area. So I have the last question. Mm. Yeah, Nilutparna, this is the last questions that we have. Can you see the questions? So in, uh, so in case of subluxated cataract, when you have a less than 90 degrees of subluxation, what is your choice? Is it a CTR? Is it a Sioni ring or a CT segment? Or would you prefer to go ahead with lensectomy with SFIOL? And in the second scenario, if you have a 90 degree to 90 degrees of subluxation, what is your preference? The preference remains the same as the first one. So your choice is yours. And if you have more than one, uh, that is a 180 degree of uh, subluxation, then again, the choices remains the same. But then you have you need to choose the correct one. So those, there are some uh, beautiful videos that uh, were shown by Dr. Ajay Paul, sir. So I think that this will be very easy for you to answer. And uh, I think we'll be getting the answers shortly, sir. It was okay. wonderful, I mean, starting from the anatomy to the uh, video, the principles of management, and also uh, brushing up your memory after having uh, seen the videos and also the case scenarios. That was really, really good, sir. Thank you. Thank you again, Satyajit. Thank you, my fellow faculties and PGs all over India. Okay. Thank you. So I stop so the share. Yeah. So in the meantime, I think before they, uh, before we receive the answers in the uh, chat room, so we will get be getting ready for uh, Dr. Satyajit Sinha sir's uh, presentation. So we all know him so well, and still I would like to introduce you to him and then it's actually an honor for me to introduce you. Uh, Dr. Satyajit Sinha, he's a cataract and glaucoma surgeon. 
He's the director of the ABI Institute, Patna. And I thank him for uh, inviting us uh, into this uh, panel. Presently, he's the academic and research committee member of All in on the East Zone for the All India Ophthalmological Society. He's the section editor of the IJO. He's a joint secretary of Bihar Ophthalmological Society. He's a member of scientific committee Bihar International Society for SICS. He's a recipient of various awards, out of which I would like to name a few. That is the IIRSI gold medal. Then there is the best <coughs> scientific paper at Bihar Ophthalmological Society. Best paper post the Karnataka Society. Educational Fund Award for the APAO at Kuala Lumpur. And he has uh, presented innumerable papers, posters, instruction courses. And he has been also a guest faculty at various international, national, and state conferences since 2001. So that is a very long time that he has been involved in the academics and research and uh, uh, of the students as well as for the society. And he is evaluator of free papers and videos for the AIOS and state conferences. He is also an LDP graduate of 2008, uh, 7 and 8 batch, and he has represented India at the APAO LDP meet in 2013 and 14 at Manila and Tokyo, respectively. And uh, to add another feather to his cap, he's also the president of the St. Michael's High School Alumni Association of Patna. So, uh, sir, we are uh, waiting eagerly for your presentation, and uh, uh, he can, uh, his presentation will be Yag Laser capsulotomy after uh, post cataract surgery. So I think over to you, sir. Uh, Nilit Panna, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, sir. Clear and loud and clear. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Okay, I'll have to log out and log in just Give me two, three minutes to get back to yes. you. Yes, so in the meantime, I think uh, we can uh, I think take sir, a few. Uh, Nilit Panna, there is a yes, question sir? there. There is a yes. question there. Why can't we use topical anesthesia in case yes. of open toe injury? Well, definitely we can injure it. Since it was for the uh, residents and the first year PGs and second year PGs, that's why I told about giving uh, the, uh, the uh, peribulbar inf infiltration. But if you are uh, uh, quite uh, uh, you know, conversant with it, or if you are have done few cases of uh, yeah, and, uh, post graduate, since it was meant for post graduate, so you can definitely use. Uh, I mean, definitely, uh, uh, senior surgeons like uh, most of us do use topical anesthesia. There's no nothing harm in doing. But be careful the topical anesthesia that you have. since it is an open globe, the corneal tear is there. The anesthetic that you use, you use it from the table, maybe use a 2% xylocaine that you have used for anesthesia, which is a sterile way, not from a bottle that is from outside. Even if you're using from a bottle, see that it is sterile or freshly opened. That's the only uh, care you have to do because here the eyeball is open, not uh, not a closed injury. So you can, you can have infection there. So uh, we have one more question uh, regarding that, uh, your CTR rings. I think uh, most of them have answered that okay, they yeah. want to go ahead. Yeah. So with the CTR for less than 90 degree, modified CTR with single look for up to 180 degree. And then up to 270 degree, they would prefer to use modified CTR with double look. And then uh, more than 270 degree, they would prefer secondary right. IRL implant. Right. Yeah. So, so I think over to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Um, Sinha, sir, is back, I guess. Uh, there's one more question. Can peribulbar anesthesia reduce pain induced by iris injury? That's that's the reason that we, uh, one of the yes. reasons that you use, because very rarely you'll have just a corneal tear. If it is a corneal tear, fine, but if there is iris or lens injury, uh, there will be definitely uh, pain induced by the uh, iris injury or iris trauma, so peribulbar anesthesia will definitely reduce that pain. So there are some good discussions that we are having because uh, the interaction is good and they are really into the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They so, are uh, really yeah. asking a lot of good questions. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah these, are, these are some of the, I mean, pertinent and practical questions that you face daily during your ER. Uh, room <clears throat> postings that uh, if you are in the ER, whether you should be going with all this, uh, no GA is available, what should you do? 
and uh, if at all you are using uh, topical and how it should be so thank you so much uh, ajay sir you really uh, i mean uh, wow. explained it so well <laughs> and i think it's uh, uh, i'm hopeful that uh, our uh, students and postgraduates and colleagues would uh, really benefit from it and then use it practically during their er postings mm -hmm. so um, anything else we would uh, like to discuss before satyajit sinha sir comes back on because i think there's some uh, technical glitch which is yeah technical glitch is there i think he has rejoined the meeting so he would be there uh one more thing of the uh, yeah i think he is uh, has he come in no 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 let me see now one more thing i would ask you when uh, when will you do in uh, gonioscopy why will you do gonioscopy because because yes, there was a question, question there yeah uh, yeah uh, no. because you normally have because of, yeah i think he is uh, yeah yeah he is there so uh, tejit you can have angle recession glaucoma so one trauma blunt trauma so gonioscopy is first at least after a month or so and the patient comes immediately you have seen and the indirect ophthalmoscopy you can get a uh, tear at the ora serrata superiorly and especially superior nasal that is the area you have to see because of the impact the eyeball is such that the impact goes and hits there the superior nasal you know orbit uh Yeah. yeah, I think he's uh, there. Um, I would yes. like to ask a question to you. Uh, like, uh, would you prefer for uh, corneal repair and cataract surgery at the same sitting, or would you prefer for a secondary, uh, I mean, second sitting surgery for the cataract? See, the Even if first, in, first instance, if the patient comes, if there are a lot of fluffy material in the atria chamber there is inflammation patient has got injury today and can come after a day there is a lot of fluffy material i know that inflammation so i would remove it but if there is a small hole on the, the cornea there is no other damage i just wait let it because the uh, the lens can be managed later on even if there is a little bit of leakage or a little bit of some material in the atria chamber i would wait take him to a, a regular ot assess it and do it most of the time we do it we allow the just the corneal uh, suture to be done let the yeah. uh, inflammation settle down because you need to know whether there is an infection available i mean the injury will cause an infection or not so that has to be assessed before we do the i yeah. think there's a glitch going on again first, uh, okay can you can you uh, see my screen now yeah yeah we can see you again it's not opening full, full screen yeah Okay. I think Satyajit, you have to play uh, face the way I uh, placed it. Yes, yes, Because yes. It's not coming full screen. Yeah, so yeah. full screen it just disappears. I don't know what happens. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Same thing. I think the other day, Dr. Partho Biswas and everybody had this problem. Okay, so, you just have to. Yeah. I, I would like to thank Dr. Nilotna for the kind introduction, and I would like to thank Dr. Jay Paul for the amazing video that he showed and for the amazing uh, presentation that he made just now. uh we are all very used to my zoom but uh, in microsoft meetings uh we have a little difficulty but still we are very grateful to intas uh, who help us every day in bring this all together uh today i'll be speaking on uh, yag laser capsulotomy though it can come as a, uh, a small question uh, but uh, most of it you will be uh, sharpening your hands once you finish your post graduation and for those who have it in their uh, uh, college they must be using it but it's important to know that you uh, but it's important to know a little bit theory also about it uh, the neodymium yttrium aluminum garnet nd yag laser is a solid state laser with a wavelength of 1064 nanometer that could disrupt ocular tissues by achieving optical breakdown with a short high power pulse the optical breakdown results in ionization or plasma formation in the ocular tissue this plasma formation then causes acoustic and shock shock waves that disrupts the tissue now almost 100% of the pacification that occur uh, occurs within 2 years after the surgery in younger groups uh, uh, that's why for very uh, uh, young infants and children where we do cataract surgery we do pccc also and the rate of pacification declines as the rate increases as the age increases now a study of the posterior capsule opacification in 5416 postmodern pseudopecic eyes identified four factors associated with reduced posterior capsular opacification 
Now, the hydro dissection associated with cortical cleanup, a lot of studies said that once you have done your anterior capsulotomy, once you have done your hydro dissection, if you keep on rotating the nucleus with the cortical matter inside the uh, bag, it uh, cleans up a lot of uh, cortical matter and uh, reduces the incidence of posterior capsule opacification also. In the bag, IUL fixation, and we'll tell you about the design of the IUL, which further helps in reducing the PCO. A continuous curvilinear capsular axis, uh, diameter slightly smaller than the IUL optic, and acrylic IL geometry with a square edge. Now, the posterior capsule opacification results from the lens epithelial cells proliferating onto the posterior capsule at the site of apposition of the anterior capsule flaps. Polishing of the posterior capsule cannot remove the epithelial cells from the anterior capsule cells flaps so it's because it's very difficult to visualize and do that. A peripheral ring in the capsular bag may reduce the opacification. Some studies have been done in which they put a CTR uh, in the bag and uh, they showed that the incidence of posterior capsule opacification was much less. Now, square and truncated edge design has been associated with reduced rates of posterior capsule opacification for both silicon and acrylic IULs. Several studies indicate posterior capsule opacification rate in lower where the anterior capsule edge overlies the optic of 360 degrees. Now, in this picture, you can see in the middle over here, there is posterior capsule opacification, and this may develop uh, after some months, after years, or after the cataract surgery on an initially clear capsule. Now, here in this picture, you can see a heavy diffuse fibrosis of a posterior capsule behind the posterior chamber IUL. Now, a red reflex <laughs> formation of the multiple small epithelial pearls after the anterior epithelial cells migrate centrally from the peripheral area of the position of anterior capsule flap to the posterior capsule. Now, when you should not do YAG laser capsulotomy, when there are corneal scars, irregularities, or edema that interfere with the target visualization or make optical breakdown unpredictable, or when there is something like nystagmus instability of the eye, glass intraocular lens is there, known or suspected CME is there, active intraocular inflammation, if it's there, you should not do YAG capsulotomy, and when there is a high risk of retinal detachment. Now, all patients require a complete ophthalmic history and examination before the treatment. All the things that are mentioned over here that, uh, that you should follow, but the most important thing before doing YAG capsulotomy, no matter how busy your OPD or how many patients are waiting or how short you are of time, you have to do a fundus examination uh, of the patient before you do uh, YAG capsulotomy. Now, you have to explain the pro proper uh, purpose and the nature of the procedure and obtain informed consent from the patient. Remember that no matter how small a procedure is in the eye, something can go wrong, and for that, you must take a consent, otherwise it will become uh, medical, this thing. The procedure is painless. You have to tell the patient. It may take a small clicks and pops may be heard. The procedure is completed in a matter of minutes. Now, once you have finished this uh, procedure of YAG capsulotomy, you may use brimonidine, a beta-blocking agent, uh, administer in the eye so that the initial spike which is there is prevented. If for some reason that is contraindicated, a topical or systemic carbonic anhydrase inhibitor or prostaglandin can be given. Now, dilation of the pupil facilitates visualization of the capsule over the broad expanse. Pupils are often eccentric, and this is something which you should keep in mind when you are doing YAG capsulotomy. Uh, the pupil uh, are often eccentric. Inattention may result in eccentric capsulotomy necessitating a second laser session. So a good way of uh, avoiding that is when the pupil is still not dilated, uh, uh, not dilated, then you go ahead and within the small pupil, you may take make a YAG uh, laser shot and that will act as a marker so that the pupil dilates to know exactly where the visual axis is. So if you have a small pupil like this, and you can see the posterior capsule over here, uh, you make a YAG laser capsulotomy one shot, and then send the patient outside uh, to dilate once again. And then when the patient comes, we'll know where the optical axis is. Now, you have to use a Abraham contact lens, uh, which is used to stabilize the eye and improve the laser beam optics, and it facilitates accurate focusing also. 
Now this can be asked by the examiner also during your viva. Of what are the advantages of Abraham lens during YAG laser? It increases the convergence uh, angle to to 24 degrees from 16 degrees. It decreases the area of laser at the posterior capsule 14 uh, mu uh, microns uh, from 21. It increases the beam diameter at both the cornea and the retina. Now you have to use this Abraham lens carefully because it's a modified posterior pole lens. If the ND YAG laser is not sent through the lens button, but rather from the peripheral carrier portion of the lens, uh, the ND YAG laser may be focused on the retina and it may cause damage. The minimal amount of energy necessary to obtain the breakdown and rupture the, ca rupture the capsule uh, as desired, at least one to two millijoules is required generally uh, with one, one millijoule is also uh, enough when you are doing it properly. The capsule is examined for wrinkles that indicate tension lines. Short shots placed across tension lines result in the largest opening per pulse because the tension causes the initial opening to expand, widen. Now the posterior capsulotomy technique, as I said earlier, the minimum energy is, minimum energy required is one millijoules if possible. Identify the tension lines. Perform a cruciate opening, begin at 12 o'clock in the periphery, progress towards the 6 o'clock and cut across at 3 and 9. You will see a video also of this. Now, and then you clean up the residu residual tags and avoid any free floating fragments. Now, I will try and show you the video over here. Posterior capsule. Next, so you we'll see, see the posterior capsule the over here. Carefully, the two red beams laser. are uh, put <laughs> together and then. This is how the uh, YAG capsulotomy is done. Now, you have to use minimum energy, use contact lens to stabilize the eye and improve the laser beam optics and facilitate accurate focusing. If the lens, uh, if the lens peaking is occurring, make a Christmas tree in the design that you are doing for the YAG capsulotomy. Identify areas of intraocular lens capsule separation and begin treatment there. Use the deep focus technique. Optical breakdowns occur in the anterior vitreous. The shock wave radiates forward and ruptures the capsule. Higher energy of two millijoules or more uh, must be used if it is required. Now, what should be the capsulotomy size? The capsulotomy should be as large as the pupil in isotropic conditions, such as driving at night when glare from the exposed capsulotomy edge is most likely. A small opening might be preferred for a patient at high risk of retinal detachment. A small opening in a dense membrane results in excellent optics analogous to those of a small pupil. Now here in the posterior capsulotomy, in this picture you can see posterior capsulotomy performed without pupillary dilatation. Uh, in the first picture you see hazy capsule before the treatment and after the treatment application the pupillary zone is there. Now, when you do uh, a glare and haze remain a problem if the opening is only about 1 to 2 millimeter, it decreases with 3 millimeter and with 4 millimeter capsular opening, there is no glare and haze. Now, after your ND YAG laser capsulotomy is done in all patients, trimonidine, as I said earlier, should be administered topically to minimize any IOP rise. For high-risk patients, IOP may be measured again at 1 hour following the laser treatment. IOP should be remeasured at four hours for patients with significant pre-existing pre glaucomatous disc damage or if the IOP is in five millimeter or more uh, at the first hour that you have checked it at. Now, increased IOP may be treated with brimonidine, uh, apraclonidine, topical beta-energetic antagonist, prostaglandin analogs, topical pilocarpine, topical or systemic uh, carbon. Uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor or hyperosmotic agents. Patient's medical history is very important. Allergies and current ocular therapy should be reviewed before determining the appropriate accurate anti-glaucoma therapy. Continue anti-glaucoma therapy for at least a week to prevent delayed uh, pressure elevations. Uh, I give it for at least a 10 days and measure the IOP again after one week. ND YAG laser posterior capsulotomy results in improved visual acuity in almost 100% of the cases, except for where some complication may happen, one or two cases. Failure of vision to improve is often due to pre-existing ocular disease, including ARMD, CME, other macular diseases, retinal detachment, corneal edema, glaucoma, ischemic optineuropathy, and amblyopia. 
अदरवाइज इट्स अ वेरी सक्सेसफुल प्रोसीजर इफ डन प्रॉपरली कॉम्प्लिकेशन कॉजिंग डिक्रीज डिविजन आर अनकॉमन बट इंक्लूड एलिवेटेड एक्स्ट्रा क्लर प्रेशर सी एम ई रेटनल डिटैचमेंट आईल डैमेज एंड ऑफ सलमाइटिस आईराइटिस विट्राइटिस मैक्लर ओल एंड कॉर्नियल एडिमा एलिवेटेड आईओपी इज द मोस्ट कॉमन ऑल दो यूजली ट्रांजियन कॉम्प्लिकेशन फॉलोइंग एन डी आगलेजर इंक्रीज आईओपी फॉलोइंग एन डी आगलेजर कैप्सलॉटमी इज एसोसिएटेड विद रिड्यूस फैसिलिटी फॉर द एक्वस ह्यूमर आउटफ्लो This reduction has been attributed to capsular debris, acute inflammatory cells, liquid with liquid vitreous and shock wave damage to the trabecular meshwork. Acute inflammatory cells and capsular debris cause increased IOP by demonstrating pigment granules, erythrocytes, fibrin, lymphocytes, and macrophages within the trabecular meshwork after laser capsulotomy. Glaucomatous eye may have increased frequency and magnitude of IOP elevation. as they already have a reduced outflow facility cystoid macular edema develops in about 0.5 uh, 5% to 2.5% of the eyes following nd yag laser post ie capsulotomy cme may occur between 3 weeks and 11 months after the capsulotomy so you have to be careful about that retinal detachment may complicate nd yag laser post ie capsulotomy in 0.08 to 3.6% of the eyes retinal detachment may occur early after the laser capsulotomy or more than a year later asymptomatic retinal breaks were found at a rate of 2.1% within one month of post ie capsulotomy in one study though it's not so common now myopia or uh, history of retinal detachment in the other eye younger age and male sex and risk are risk factor following nd yag laser post ie capsulotomy in uncomplicated phaco emulsification and pcil Uh, implantation a rate of retinal detachment after laser capsulotomy of 0 to 0.4% over 1 to 8 years has been reported in two series now pitting of the iul is something which was seen uh, earlier uh, when the yag laser had come and it was used to be done about uh, 15 20 years back but now with all the advanced machine and all the skills that all the surgeons have uh, pitting is not seen so commonly pitting of iul occurs in 15% to 33% of the eyes during nd yag laser post ie capsulotomy pitting uh, is usually not visually significant although rarely damage may cause sufficient glare and image degradation that the damaged iul must be explanted now p acne and of thalmitis uh, uh, rarely heard of but even in my uh, 19 years of practice i have experienced one patient Uh, with p acne and of thalmitis uh, luckily she is doing well now but i had a very tough time managing it uh, has been reported following nd yag laser post ie capsulotomy patients have decreased vision caused by post ie capsular opacification and otherwise white eye in p acne following laser uh, capsulotomy some eyes develop significant uveitis glaucoma and loss of vision the pressure also rises and the u- uveitis is so unmanageable you have to wash the bag that you with take me so many and so many other things uh, the capsulotomy is presumed to have uh, the capsulotomy is presumed to have created opportunity for the organism within the capsule to have reached the vitreous and developed into a endophthalmitis now here you can see the iul pitting in the picture on the right hand side one thing which i want to tell is that a lot of uh, doctors are now using multifocal trifocal iul and when you are doing a uh, yag capsulotomy you have to be very careful because if if the if it hits the lens then the patient will be very unsatisfied and it will be very difficult to uh, manage that patient uh, thank you so much for your patient hearing i'll uh, put my questions uh, now over here and then uh, you can answer in the chat box uh, once i have them i'll just uh, and you can ask question also i'll just stop sharing it so my first question is uh, to the post graduates of what is the most preferred iul design to prevent the pco and i'll give just about 5 seconds for that And so we already got the answer i think 2 uh, to 3 seconds <laughs> so that's nice Well, Abhilash, Dr. Abhilash has answered. Yeah, that's nice. That's good. Okay. <laughs> Second question is: What is the minimal energy required so that uh, 
we, uh, the uh, yard cap slot me can be done. What is the minimal energy required for PCO? One millijoule. Okay. Uh, what is the optimal size of the opening of the PCO so that there is no glare and haze? What is the optical size of the opening of the posterior capsule so that there is no? Uh, what is the? So that's answer four millimeters. Incidence of CME of cystoid macular edema in yard caps lock me, post yard caps lock me. What is the incidence of CME? Something which you should be careful about when you are doing uh, yard caps lock me and yard you should also be keeping an eye on that. So that was just in the third last or the fourth last slide. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so the answer is about 0.5% to 2.5%. And what is the incidence of retinal detachment uh, in uh, yak? <laughs> what is the incidence of retinal detachment in post uh, yak capsulotomy? That was my last question. And uh, no, that's wrong. Point one. Yes, almost, almost. 0 0.08 percent to 3.6 percent. It varies from uh, within different studies. But thank you very much for this, uh, and I, I hope it will be a little helpful uh, for the. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, sir, that's uh, that was really very nice and a good insight into when and how you should be doing a yak capsulotomy, especially in these situations where you have. In the recent trends where we are using multifocals, what should be avoided? So that was really nice. And uh, moving ahead with uh, our last discussion, we have with us a uh, young and dynamic uh, personality here, Dr. Sagar Bhargava, whom I would like to introduce. And uh, uh, my slide is not visible, I guess. Uh, so, one second. Just should a minute, sir. Microsoft meeting. No, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's visible, I guess. <laughs> no, no, so, Dr. Sagar Bhargav is a senior consultant in BBI Foundation Kolkata and he's a director in SLRI and Retina Surgeons Private Limited Kolkata. He's completed his MBBS and MS from uh, Government Medical College, Aurangabad. And he has been an uh, achiever since his first years in MBBS. He won the Pandit Palitkar Memorial Prize for being the topper in his batch in 1995 in the first MBBS. Then the Bahal Chandra Mukund Randeka Memorial Prize for first in the subject of ophthalmology in the third MBBS. So you can see that uh, from the beginning he has shown he, he has a remarkable uh, aptitude towards the subject. And then Dr. R. L. Bhai Chandra Memorial Prize for securing highest marks in ophthalmology university exam in 2003. So uh, while working in Shankara Netrala Chennai, he was recognized as the best associate consultant for the year 2008 and was conferred the Dr. T. L. K. Uh, Rao Endowment Award. And in 2008, after successfully clearing the examination, he was conferred the FRCS Glasgow. And then he started the LASIK Center at Shankara Netrala Kolkata in 2011 and was the first to use the femtosecond LASIK uh, in the eastern region of the country. He has been actively involved as a speaker and a panelist in many academic activities at state and national level and has also been a part of uh, a team for conducting construction courses for CATRAC on CATRAC at ASCRS. So we welcome you, uh, Dr. Sagar Bharti, and uh, I uh, would like to uh, hand over you the screen for the, um, the session. And I really uh, appreciate uh, you for the last minute uh, uh, conducting this uh, session. And thank you so much. So over to you, Dr. Bhargava. I, 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 I cannot, uh, I do not have enough words to thank Dr. Sagar Bhargav uh, for uh, joining us this evening. Dr. Sonu Goyal certainly <laughs> got stuck in the rains in Jaipur and he got and then later he got stuck in the operating room. He got late over there. Uh, so he begged uh, apology uh, that he would not be able to uh, be with us this evening. And then immediately I uh, contacted Dr. Sagar Bhargav and he was so kind and uh, he was ready with the presentation. I'm, I'm extremely, extremely and deeply grateful to you, Dr. Sagar, for your uh, 
uh, acceptance to do this in the last minute. Thank you so much. We have a question for you from Dr. Abhishek uh, for Dr. Sinha, sir. Yeah. In the meeting. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think he's there. I'll keep answering it on the chat box so that the talk can continue. Sagar is yeah, mute. Sagar has to be unmute himself. Sagar has to unmute himself. Sagar, you are mute. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, I thank Dr. Satyajit again for a uh, kind invite to me. And uh, this is probably uh, uh, the shortest time that <laughs> I have done for a presentation. <laughs> It, it is a nice experience for me as well. You know, you give less time, your my mind works more. So today was the example for that. <laughs> so believe me, I just had a presentation on um, for five or six slides on uh, IOL rotation of a case of mine. So whatever I have done, it's a very small kind of presentation which I could just manage in the last uh, 45 minutes. So pardon me if I have missed something and probably uh, uh, Dr. Paul, who is a very senior uh, uh, surgeon here, he can uh, chip in and whenever he feels that he needs to put in any points, OK? So let me start my presentation. So I'll be speaking on management of residual refractive surprise post cataract surgery. Now, we are in, 19, in 2020. And uh, believe me, now the patient's expectations are really sky high. In fact, uh, when we used to do LASIK counseling, we would always tell the patient that you might still end up with a small refractive surprise. Now, that counseling now I have to do for my cataract patients also. I have to tell them that you, you might have a 0.75 one diaper surprise. Don't be worried about it. So they are so hellbound in ha having a absolute, uh, you know, plano uh, correction, and they look for whatever target you have set for them. So patient satisfaction is what you have promised that is equal to the achieving the target. But for that, you need to understand what patient wants, what is your biometry, and based on your biometry and patient's eye, you need to do a proper IL selection. And beyond this, the next part is ensuring an urbanful surgery. See, all the three things should work in tandem to give you the target. Now, why patients are unhappy? So if you look at this, uh, this study, which was published in BGO 2011, they looked at the causes of cataract surgery malpractice claims in England. And uh, to my surprise, the claims were mainly related to biometry errors and wrong IL power. And they were the second most frequent cause of the claims. And in these cases, 62% had to, have, uh, the surgeon had to pay damages. So what is happening in West about 10 years back probably will start in India soon with a lot of malpractice claims coming with refractive surprise. So we have to be very careful when we uh, do our surgeries. Now, in another study which looked at the, the largest series, which looked at, uh, you know, explantation or exchange of lenses, so out of 164 cases, the, uh, the, these were the four common reasons for uh, the, uh, the error. One was in, in, inaccurate biometry, second was wrong aisle selection, third one was transcription error, and fourth was handwriting misinterpretation. misinterpretation. So obviously, uh, these three th things definitely can be improved, can be, uh, can be tackled by setting a proper system with us. Inaccurate biometry, I think we had a very nice class on biometry. So probably if you take pearls from that class, uh, the chances of inaccurate biometry will reduce to a great, great extent. So when we look at biometry ac accuracy, this was in 2008, the main causes of biometry inaccuracy were basically axial and measurement. This has been addressed by optical biometry now. IOL formula, ELP prediction. Now, all of us know that ELP is effective lens position. So this was the one of the main reasons why uh, the biometry was not accurate. So almost 35% had some problem with the ELP prediction. 10% errors were because of the keratometry uh, problems, probably in non-calibrated instrument or patient had dry eye or patient had some scar leading to erroneous measurement. But surprise part is that when you look at the fourth factor, that was a post-operative refraction. That means we have a tendency of giving refraction usually in two weeks time. And a lot of times if you get an error of minus one, 1.5, you will label that patient as a post-operative post uh, surprise. So what this study tells you is that you should wait for at least six to eight weeks 
before labeling that that as a surprise because a lot of times it may be <laughs> just an error at the optometry level the refraction was done not done correctly for whatever the reasons either the skill issue or there was no uh, there was a lot of rush in the opd so this point also one has to keep in mind so before you label the patient of uh, patient as a post operative surprise have a look at this uh, photograph this is a patient who uh, had a, uh, had come for a glass appointment and had a error of minus 2.5 uh, can somebody tell me what it is this is a i can give you a hint this is a lens this is a post capsule what is this in between so this is a clear space in between the lens and the posterior capsule basically this is nothing but a early onset capsular back distension syndrome and this condition is known to produce uh, shifting of the iol forward which in turn can lead to a myopic surprise so whenever you have a myopic surprise first thing you would need to do is see the see the lens and see the posterior capsule now if there is a back distension syndrome one thing to remember clearly is that you will not see the posterior edge of the lens and the posterior capsule in one uh, uh, one view you will have to really go deep in to see the posterior capsule so this is a is a condition you need to actively look into a lot of times we kind of miss this and the uh, treatment is actually very simple for that condition is just uh, do a small yak capsulotomy puncture and this lens will go in go back to its position and the refraction gets uh, refractive surprise gets resolved so once you are sure that there is a refractive surprise 6 weeks i have gone by patient has a minus 2.5 minus 3 Uh, residual refractive error first thing is that you as a surgeon should accept that there is a refractive surprise and then share this situation to the patient it should not be the case that uh, you have uh, seen a refractive surprise and you are not telling this to the patient and patient uh, uh, gets to know this from some other doctor that will be very bad on your part like this example if you see this gentleman i had operated <coughs> both eyes the left eye uh, had done a toric iol the, the result was fantastic plano 6x6 but the other eye had had a issue with the respect to the iol uh, rotation so patient had landed up with a cyl cylinder of 1.75 though best correct visibility was 6 by 6 but uncorrected was 6 by 18 now at this point uh, we did tell the patient that there is an iol axis that has been rotated and we gave the patient an option that you need to do a rotation patient was not very keen wanted to use glasses document this in your file because tomorrow if the patient goes in the court it should not be the point that you have not told the patient so this is a very important point to keep that even if you are doing a toric iol and if you get a refractive surprise document it in the file uh, do a lot of patients are not very keen for a secondary intervention but it is your duty that you have to tell the patient that you need to uh, go ahead for a correction now how do we address, uh, address a surprise so they, they basically you have three options one is you do an iol exchange or a rotation when the patient, when when it is a very early onset uh, uh, intervention you can also think of putting a piggy bag iol when the patient has come uh, after some time maybe 6 months or one year down the line and patient is not very happy with the with the with the residual refraction or one can also do in a lasik or a prk it's called as a uh, such a now let me share with you another example now this is a patient who has undergone left eye cataract surgery you can see the left eye biometry report here uh, and everything looks fine the patient's mrd number is fine uh, patient's uh, axial length uh, lens power calculation this uh, was fine so we went ahead and put this lens this uh, biometry was done by a very experienced biometrist in our uh, hospital and uh, there was nothing to really uh, sus be suspicious about so we put in the lens and we got a plus 3 hyperopic surprise now why this is so now whenever you get a surprise like this first thing that you need to do is repeat the biometry again and as i told you the other day that if there is a lens in the eye you have to change the status of the uh, the biometry machine to a pseudophotic status so that the machine makes automatic adjustments for it so when we repeated this biometry so the, you see the other eye the left eye actually is giving a power of around uh, was giving around a 23.5 so what has happened was there was a wrong eye entry by the biometrist so he has done the right eye calculation but has mentioned it in the as the left eye so this is what we call it as a transcription error so you have to be very very clear about this the team has to be very clear about this that they don't do a wrong eye entry this is a very common phenomena yeah. you land up in problems in a very small percentage of patients who have anisometropia so keep this in mind uh, another example i'll give you how to tackle a i a, a surprise falling toric iol so this was a 74 year gentleman who had planned for a cataract surgery in the left eye this was his his uh, pre cataractus uh, refraction you can see patient had a minus 3 
cylinder and uh, we went ahead and uh, planned for a toric IOL. Uh, again, this patient we could not do an optical, but we did a normal uh, contact biometry and we got about plus 22. We were expecting a residual uh, refractive sphere of uh, minus 0.55. 5, 5, 5, uh, so here uh, we are doing the IOL calculation. So one thing to remember is that you get two values in this, uh, this chart after calculation. One is the cylinder power at the IOL plane and cylinder power at the corneal plane. So both has to be known and the, the, the calculator will tell you what model you have to use. So this patient needed a 22 acryol EC. This is an Indian lens. So we went ahead and implanted the lens. So this is the case. Uh, is the video seen? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, we can see. Yeah, so this is a mid dilated pupil. In toric IOL, you have to make sure that you use iris hooks because you will not be able to see the mark. So you can see on table, it's kind of almost matching with the thing. There may be some little, little bit of para parallax uh, error here, but more or less we thought it's quite okay. We uh, thin the thing, but at glass appointment, this was the thing. So patient had an uncorrected visual of 6 by 36, but had a cylinder of minus 2. So from minus 3, it became minus 2, but it is uh, absolutely left us uh, quite surprised as to why this has happened. So next thing we did was we checked the lens position on the thing. Now there are different ways of assessing the axis on slit lamp. One of the commonest methods is to use this, uh, this knob which is available on each slit lamp and rotate it, rotate the, the slit beam so that uh, it aligns to the marks on the IOL. And then you read the, read the position on the scale here. But the problem with this is that it gives you a scale of 5. So it will not tell you whether it's 11, 12, 13. It will just give you five, uh, 10, 15 or thing. Other, other things you have to interpret on your own. So what is the other method of doing it? Uh, it's a very simple method, which, uh, which uh, I discovered while using this keynote and which uh, basically you have to use a straight line on the, on the keynote, which is available. Uh, if somebody wants to uh, know more de details about this method, it's a very simple method. Just you draw a, a straight line joining the dots on the lens and automatically you will get a, the, just to show you, so there is a, okay, I'll leave this. You can do one thing, you can, uh, yeah, this, this uh, how to measure this, you can go to my YouTube channel. Uh, it has a uh, elaborate presentation on how to measure toric IOL axis using a keynote. So that, that it's a very simple technique and you will get values which are to the extent of 12, 13, 14. So in this case, it was 12 degrees. When we use this uh, iToric uh, app, which is available on Play Store, that also gave me a value of around 12 degrees. So we, now it's very clear that uh, uh, zero degree was the placement and 12 degree was the actual achievement. So we, uh, there was a 12 degree of rotation of the lens. So we went to this website called as astigmatism.com, astigmatismfix.com, which essentially tells me uh, how much degree of rotation I need to do to get the refraction back. So this basically, again, is a calculator wherein you need to enter data with regard to the lens uh, model, what is the cylinder power at the corneal plane? So I showed you that value. Then uh, you need to see what is the current IOL axis and what is the lens power? And where was the original axis? The original axis was 180 degree. We, the present lens is at 12 degrees. And you need to mention the current refraction, which was around minus two at 60 degrees and uh, the visual acuity. Now, once this is done, you just hit calculate. And then it will give you a diagram like this, which will tell you that this is the red line, which will, which will be the axis which you will aim for. And uh, it will tell you that you need to rotate this lens by 17 degrees clockwise. So this data will come and it will give you a refraction of this much. If you transpose, you will get a refraction of this much. So with this information with us, we again went ahead and uh, uh, opened this eye. Uh, you can use the same side port entries and, uh, and uh, just the two side ports entries we are opening and uh, just try to dial the lens back to 180 degrees. So you can see this lens point here. So this is what we need to shift. So this, this was the original and this is the lens. So this is about 12 degrees. So now you basically under irrigation, you are just rotating the lens so that it comes back to the, uh, to the desired axis. And this was done at, at two weeks uh, following the cataract surgery. And uh, what happens now? So what we see is that the under uncorrected visual acuity has improved to 6 by 18. The cylinder has become zero, but there is a spherical uh, error. Now, when you have a spherical error, remember we had aimed for a minus 0.5 uh, to start with. So we got about a 0.5 of additional error 
which may be linked to the a constant optimization now a constant optimization is basically required for newer lenses wherein you need to do at least 25 uh, surgeries and you can do this a constant optimization by by logging into different websites one of the website is from uh, uh, from an indian surgeon called dr saurav shahani and you can use this uh, calculator which is very simple which asks you basically k1 k2 axial length anterior chamber depth il power implanted and post op data and based on that it will tell you what is the optimized uh, constant for that particular lens one thing you have to remember is that you know, when you are optimizing your a constant it should be optimized for the same incision size and same incision location that's very important because uh, if you change that then the that the optimization uh, falters so that's very important so with toric iol one has to remember one thing there is to avoid iol rotation you have to keep the iop normally one when we close the surge, when we close the cataract surgery we tend to over inflate the anterior chamber we tend to keep the pressure a little high but in this case uh, in a toric iol you need to keep it slightly less than the nova this is all recommended then you should avoid too much of movement in the first hour now first hour is the critical hour for iol uh, toric iol patients because that's the time when maximum rotation can happen and uh, a lot of pay, pay, people use ctr with in a standard axial uh, length eyes it has no role actually uh, for a, for a high myopic eyes yes there can be one role but it's for a standard axial length it has no role and when you notice an rotation it's preferable to rotate it within two weeks but it can be done any time up to six months also so don't be worried about that uh, you know four months have passed by what, what we can do we had one patient uh, who came who did the surgery and did not come back for a follow up he came landed up straight after six months and uh, we found that there was uh, the the surgeon actually was somebody else but he found that, that there was a almost nine, 90 degree axis transposition that means the the, the iol was planned should have been planned for 90 degrees and patient the lens was at 180 degree so the patient was taken up for surgery even after six months and uh, the result was then uh, then achieved now coming to another aspect wherein you you can just uh, play, uh, you know slip a, a second iol to counteract the the uh, the residual refraction and this is called as a secondary piggyback and you have now lenses available uh, where you can use that now the calculation for this i had also told you the, on the other day when we were doing biometry for uh, a special situation is a holiday refractive formula which is available in holiday software uh it is a paid software so it's not easily available the other way of doing it is to just uh, find out what is the error of refraction so in our first case it was about first plus 3 so you multiply plus 3 by 1.5 so you need to put a uh, put a lens of uh, 4.5 iol uh, diopter lens uh, as to be put now for a myopic it becomes one so three would become just three uh, and remember most uh, again i've been just reiterating the fact that biometry in pseudophakia you have to uh, correct the machine settings because if you don't correct it the sound velocity differs this is for the for the standard uh, contact biometry you can see the sound velocities differ and the there the axial length will either be noted as higher or lower depending on the lens that is there so uh, just to sum up so you have to make your system of biometry iol ordering iol transfer in the ot error free every incidence that you get in the ot or, or every surprise that you get you need to uh incorporate that in your system so that that kind of error doesn't happen it's very rare in uh, today's scenario and and if it happens there's nothing to be worried about except it that there is an error on your part and give a solution to it i think that that is my presentation thank you for your patient hearing thank you anything probably which i would have missed uh, dr paul can add no no i think you have done absolutely fine i think you have covered almost everything and something that is there in everybody's mind that if that's what you have uh, stressed it and i have also because i have changed a lens almost after a year so you can i have changed a hydrophobic okay. lens now see the uh, the idea came that you cannot touch it because the, you've made a very important point so let the eye settle down maybe one one and a half two months you still could see the idea came that hydrophobic lenses cannot they stick to the uh, the bag immediately that's wrong because see i i won't blame my earlier generation surgeons or thing see the inflammation we control inflammation see why is the addition because of the post operative inflammation we are so meticulous in our surgery today and we give steroid or nsaid so we want minimal inflammation minimal inflammation means hydrophobic lens you can rotate almost after as i say one month two months and three months that's a good point and if you are putting hydrophobic lens well definitely you can wait 
And I think the error part, which you said, I mean, this happened to me. Instead of uh, 16, I put 20, uh, 26. It was written 16, the handwriting yeah. part. Yeah. It took yeah. 10 years back. I put a yeah. silicon lens. I have changed it after almost two weeks, and all those things have happened. So one thing that residents or anybody can practice is if you are doing in these early years, if you're doing biometry, recheck biometry. If you're doing a, a, a senior surgeon has given you a case to do it, just see that this patient, I'll recheck my biometry. And before putting the lens, you again ask, make it a habit right from the beginning that just before the patient comes in, you yourself check them. Don't, I mean, it's not that you have got a good system in place, but still as a surgeon, because the onus is on you, because you cannot say that my optometrist is my So it's always on us mm -hmm. to recheck the biometry uh, the right eye, left eye, and the patient's name. I think that we can do it. When many times we leave it to your junior or leave it to our, you know, OT attendants who get the lens and give it to you. So these are small things. And then what you have said about the toric is definitely something. I mean, it's not a postgraduate, but definitely they should keep it done. And especially those websites and all, they are wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, invaluable input. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarga Bhargav, for uh, saving us in the last three months that we have been doing this. Today was the first uh, time uh, that uh, such an incident happened, and you are so much uh, God sent that you saved <laughs> the day. Thank you so much. I'm very, very, very grateful to you. Yes, thank you. It's just a religious mind. Thank you. I would like to thank Dr. Nilusparna for the amazing moderation that she has done today. I would like to thank Dr. Ajay Paul uh, for the amazing video that he showed and for his excellent talk. I would like to inform all the postgraduates that next week we have uh, uh, an uh, esteemed uh, faculty from PGI Chandigarh and from Shankar Nitrale Chinnai, uh, including uh, uh, Professor Jyotirmay Biswas, who will be talking on uh, different aspects of UBITIS. Uh, so we will have six days of uveitis, uh, followed by the next and the last week of all this program, which will be on uh, neuroophthalmology, ocular trauma, and uh, tumors. Uh, two two days each in the following week, and that will be the end of this program. So, but next week we have uh, uveitis, uh, and I am looking forward uh, for all of you to join us uh, on Monday evening. Uh, for that program, and it's a basic clinical approach for a case of uveitis, which is by Dr. Partho Pratim Das Majumdar of Shankar Netrale Chennai. Uh, so, once again, thank you, Dr. Jay Paul. Thank you, Dr. Sagar Bhargav. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Satyajit. Thank you, Nilut thank, thank, thank you, Sagar. I think it was a thank wonderful, you, wonderful thank discussion. You, thank, thank you. Thank you, Inchas, once again, and thank you, Manish Ji, Chandrasekhar Ji, uh, for.